Good afternoon. It's wonderful to see everyone here. My name is Kate Harrison. I'm on the Berkeley City Council. I represent the downtown of Berkeley, so this very stage. I'm very excited today to introduce John Diaz, who will then introduce the panel on income inequality. We have seen inequality from internationally down to our very streets in Berkeley. This is an incredibly important topic for us, and I'm glad to see so many of you here engaged. So with that, I'll introduce John, who's the editor page editor of the San Francisco Chronicle. John. John has been in a, on a wide variety of papers, staffs, and has been, how long have you been in this role? 22 years on the Chronicle. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to John. And again, thank you for atten your attention to issues that we all deeply care about. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And welcome all of you to the uh, Chronicle stage here. Uh, it's really a pleasure for the Chronicle to be part of the fourth annual uh, book festival here in uh, the Bay Area. Uh, our topic today is in income inequality a world gone mad, mean, and immoral. And I'm really, it's my pleasure to have three authors here who have really done some, some great work looking at the causes, the effects, and the solutions to this issue. I have uh, Jeffrey Clements, who is the author of a book, Corporations Are Not People, Reclaiming Democracy from Big Money and Global Corporations. A fine book. And then also we have Robert Reich, who is, <laughs> and I know you're, you're applauding because he's one of our most popular columnists in our Sunday newspaper <laughs> every week in the insights section. Robert's uh, new book is The Common Good, also highly recommended. And then finally, we have uh, Stephen Clifford, who uh, has written a book called The CEO Machine, which is, of course, very relevant to today. And let me start, I, I wanna, I read all three of the books and in fact uh, wrote about them in my column in tomorrow's insights section. And there were just a lot of really, I thought, compelling facts in each of those uh, books. And I wanted to uh, start the discussion by asking uh, each of our panelists about a fact that I found particularly uh, powerful in their, in their uh, studies. Let's start with you, uh, Jeff Clements. Um, you basically make the point in your book that income inequality is really an outgrowth of political inequality. And you have a figure in there that 80% of political contributions come from just 0.5% of the population. Yeah, thanks, thanks, John. And thanks for uh, all of you being here today. Um, yeah, so my, my book tried to explain after uh, you know, almost three decades of law practice where I have represented large corporations, I have prosecuted large corporations at the Attorney General's office in Massachusetts, how much the Constitution had changed since I was in law school. And of course, we're going to have an amendment coming, but it hasn't happened yet. So if the Constitution has changed, somebody changed it. And it's about what led to the Citizens United decision that struck down our campaign finance laws and essentially created superpowered rights for money and corporations and a equivalent loss of rights for Americans. And until we fix that, it'll be very difficult in my view, John, to tackle the problem of income inequality because they go together. I mean, in a healthy democracy, people don't choose policies that drive down wages for most people and that uh, drive up benefits for the powerful at the expense of the less powerful. That's not what normal, healthy societies would choose in a healthy political system. And so I looked at, um, at that connection between political inequality and the resulting gross economic inequality. And let me just put a bit of a lawyer uh, detail on that, and I, it won't be too uh, legalese, but you know, the Supreme Court if I went, I did a brief in the Citizens United case, if I went back to the court and argued that we should have effective campaign finance laws uh, and limitations, reasonable limitations, so that we don't have such a concentrated power where 
80% of the money in the system is coming from a very few privileged pieces of our society. If I argued that the reason we need to have that is because Americans are equal citizens, that we're entitled to equality, we're entitled not to economic equality, we're entitled to representation and voting on, and participation in our political system on equal terms, I would lose. The Supreme Court would say, that sounds suspiciously like you're trying to level the playing field. <laughs> yeah, I plead guilty. And the Supreme Court Chief Justice Roberts has said in court, it's unconstitutional to have a level playing field. Political equality is not a basis anymore for campaign finance laws. And they have also rewritten the definition of corruption so that, and now almost bribery, we can't prohibit anymore. Um, we certainly can't prohibit systemic bribery, or systemic, Freudian slip, systemic corruption, <laughs> and try to correct our, our, our imbalance in how we're funding our political system. And so the results, of course, are policies that favor those who have a lot of representation, and that's those who have a lot of money. So whether it's antitrust, tax, wage policies, across the board, it's a systemic problem. Uh, e both economies and democracies are systems. And if you have a, written a few basic rules and you've changed those rules, the outcomes are gonna be radically different. And so now all the outcomes are driving towards economic inequality, but in my view, the root of it is because we've lost our political equality. And if we can fix that, which we can, we can begin to get a whole set of different kinds of policies that will drive down the gross economic inequalities and and, uh, and, and have a much healthier, not only healthier political system, but a, a fair, good economy that works for everybody. Thank you. Robert Reich, I, I think anyone who uh, reads your column regularly or has read some of your other books has seen you on cable TV as a very strong advocate. By the way, here you won't get interrupted. <laughs> I'm on cable TV. Uh, knows that you, you really made made the case in so many ways that really uh, a healthy middle class is, is really essential to the economy. I was struck in your book by where you basically talked about the uh, diminution of the American dream. And I thought one, one figure really stuck out in, and I'd like you to address it, and that's that in the early 1940s, 90% of Americans born during that time were earning more than their parents by the time they reached their primary earning years, prime earning years. But for Americans born in the early 1980s, mid to mid 1980s, only half were earning as much as their parents. I mean, this is really fundamental to what we define as um, the American dream, the American possibility. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> See, I tell him he won't get interrupted, so he <laughs> This is what we get. Uh, it, the, the crisis we are now in, and I, and I want to talk to you about that, because the book is about that crisis. It's a crisis that is a political crisis, a moral crisis, a crisis of economics, and it all comes together. You know, Donald Trump is the consequence of what has happened in this country for the last 35 years. He is not the cause. And for 35 years, we have had, if you are in the bottom 70 to 80% of Americans by income or wealth, you are on a downward escalator. When I was Secretary of Labor in the 1990s, I'd go out to the Rust Belt and to the South and to what we now call red states. And I talked with a lot of people who told me that they were working harder than ever and getting nowhere. And that after the financial crisis, of 2008, when the banks got bailed out, but homeowners didn't, and not a single Wall Street executive went to jail, I went back to a lot of those cities and those communities and those people that I had talked with in the 1990s, and now they told me not only did they feel that they were working harder and getting nowhere, but they told me that the game was rigged against them and they told me over and over and over again, and this is in almost every red state, and I visited about, about 12 of them and talked extensively to people, 
They told me that they were having a hard time deciding between two presidential candidates. This was in the middle of 2015. And the two presidential candidates they were trying to decide between were Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. And I said, how can you possibly <laughs> utter those two names in the same sentence? <laughs> and they said to me repeatedly, the game is rigged and therefore we want somebody who is going to shake things up. Well, they got somebody. <laughs> Let me just say that there is a vicious cycle at work, and that vicious cycle is that as more and more income and wealth go to the top, more and more income and wealth can influence politics, and as they influence politics, those politics become more and more distorted in favor of income and wealth at the top. Meanwhile, a lot of people get angry and disillusioned and are more susceptible to demagogues. This is not new in history. Demagogues who channel that anger and that rage against scapegoats called immigrants or the poor or black or whatever you want to and however you want to characterize those scapegoats. How, therefore, do vicious cycles get turned back into constructive, positive, virtuous cycles? Well, you have to read my book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but just to give you the headline, uh, I am actually optimistic. I'm optimistic because, number one, historically, Every time we've had this kind of thing, and we had it in the 1830s, we had it in the 1890s, we had it, some would say, again in the 1920s, we have reversed it through reform. People have rolled up their sleeves, Americans, and got to the hard work of doing it. It is up to every single one of us, and we have done it before. We're very pragmatic. I'm also optimistic because of young people. I have the great privilege of teaching here at Cal, and I have never come across a generation of young people as committed, as idealistic, as dedicated, as willing and able to reform the system as the current generation of young people. I mean, talk about young people. Look at those young people in Florida. Look at, the, look at their courage. Their eloquence. And I'm also optimistic, finally, because the one silver lining on the Trump cloud is that more people are getting involved in politics at the grassroots, understanding that citizenship is not just a matter of voting and serving on juries and paying taxes. It's a matter of engagement. It's a matter of getting out the vote. You know, Donald Trump was elected with 27% of the vote. 27% of people who were eligible to vote. Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, of course, but even she got only a little bit more than 27%. Over 40% of Americans did not vote. And in midterm elections, it's even worse. On average, 60% don't vote. The biggest party in this country is not the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, it's the party of non-voters. This election of 2018 and the election of 2020, historical elections, will be determined by turnout. And everybody who is here, everybody who's watching, everybody who hears this, every one of your friends, anybody here who has a friend or a relative in a red state, put up your hands. A friend or relative, all right, call them today. <laughs> See what they are doing to enhance turnout particularly if they're Democrats. <laughs> Thank you. And it's not too early to think about Christmas shopping for those uh, relatives in red, shade, red states who got the, Bob's book. Um, St Stephen Clifford, uh, you write about CEO pay and how it has been distorted and inflated over the years. And an interesting... Um, 
uh, fact in, in your book is that you point out in the 1890s, J.P. Morgan suggested that a community's highest wage should be more, no, no more than 20 times the average wage. Now, here in the uh, modern U.S., CEO pay increased tenfold in the 1980s, and today it is 300 to 700 times the average wage. How did this happen? Well, uh, first I'd like to compliment uh, Jeff and Bob for being superb warm-up acts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to give you a couple of uh, uh, data points, in the U.S. it's now 300 to uh, 600 uh, times the typical employee. As late as 1978, it was only 26. In Japan today, it's 16. In the most admired organization in the U.S. today, which is the U.S. military, it is under five. And how it happened was... In the 1980s, first you had an intellectual revolution about what the purpose of business was. And you get the Michael Jensen and the shareholder value school uh, saying the only purpose of business is to maximize your stock price. You have no, you have no other purpose. Uh, the business roundtable that prior to the 80s had seen itself as Big business should res be responding to all its stakeholders, its unions, government, consumers, suppliers, etc. Uh, over time, went to that uh, school of stake uh, shareholder value. So you had an intellectual revolution, and then you had, in a sense, a procedural revolution. You got a whole new industry called executive compensation consultants. They came in and said to companies, you're doing executive compensation all wrong. Uh, you're giving the CEO the same increase that you give everybody else. Uh, and you, you, what you're doing is you're having internal equity. You've got to move to external equity. CEOs have to be paid consistent what other CEOs of equal companies are paid. Now, there's no uh, empirical evidence that w this was, would pursue any better outcomes. Uh, but as it started to roll, CEOs soon learned that they got paid a hell of a lot more when they had these consultants in. Uh, the board found out that uh, board fees were highly correlated with CEO fees. And uh, the consultants were doing very, very well. You, so, so all the parties that were concerned with this uh, had a great uh, interest in seeing it uh, go. It's a highly complicated system now of surveys and judgments and this and that. Uh, but since it's gone in, uh, CEO pay has risen about 1,000%, while the average worker pay has risen 11%. Uh, and let me just make one more point, because whenever I start talking about CEO pay, people tell me, it's the market. It's the market. So the, these guys, and I'll use a male pronoun, because 95% of them are men, these guys are worth it. Clearly, the companies wouldn't pay if, it, if they weren't worth it. There is no market for CEOs. Companies do not bid for another company's CEO. Less than 2% of Fortune 500 CEOs were previously CEO of another public company. Uh, and the reason they don't bid for other company CEOs is to be a uh, successful CEO, and I was a CEO for 15 years, you have to know a tremendous amount about a single company about its culture, its history, its board, its personnel, its distribution system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That knowledge, which is very valuable within that company, is of no value outside that company. That's why 75% of all CEOs are internal promotions. It's rare that a, comp that a CEO moves from one large company to another, and when they do, they usually fail. Uh, the, these people are not like LeBron James. LeBron James can, ha, has skills that are portable. He can take his skills and improve any basketball team, except the Warriors, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, immediately. Uh, they're not like that. No, other companies don't want them. They're not bidding for them. So the idea that you have to pay these insane amounts to keep your CEO is, is just a myth. I want to 
take a moment to thank the Stephen M. Silverstein Foundation for sponsoring this session. Uh, now, let's, let me throw out some, uh, yes, thank you, Stephen M. Silverstein. I want to throw out some questions uh, that, that, and with all the panelists jumping in. Let me start with you, Bob. I want to follow up on talking about the vicious cycle, because as I read your three books, uh, I see a lot of themes that were evident in the Trump campaign, you know, the, the rigged system and in the Sanders campaign as well, the, the rigged system, the concern about uh, income inequality, people being left behind. Um, and if you take away the xenophobia, the racism and the Islamophobia, I mean, a lot of Trump's points are, are in these books. How, do, how do, does the left or Democrats break this vicious cycle and bring the kinds of reforms that you're talking about that in the past have pulled the U.S. out of uh, similar situations? Well, first of all, Democrats have to have courage and they have to be bold and they can't simply play up to their major funders. You know, there is a big difference between the two parties, and I have been very close to politics for 50 years. It's not Tweedledum and Tweedledee, but they are still too close. That is, starting in the 1980s, Democrats began getting funding from the same sources, the same big corporations and the same Wall Street banks as the Republicans. And I'll tell you, you're not going to bite the hand that feeds you. You're, you're not going to do anything big. Uh, I was labor secretary for almost five years in the Bill Clinton administration, and I still have the scars <laughs> to show from the fights that I lost. And I say that with a great deal of regret and a lot of pain. I admire and admired Bill Clinton and I have known Bill Clinton since he was 22 years old, and I knew Hillary Clinton since she was 18. In fact, I even went out on a date with her once. <laughs> I'm not gonna say any more about that. <laughs> but but let, me, let, that me just, let me just say that if the Democrats are going to be relevant, they have got to fight for single-payer health care. They've got to fight for a, uni a universal basic income. They've got to fight for a federal job guarantee. They've got to fight to get big money out of politics. They've got to fight for unions and for a rebirth of American trade unions. They have got to do a lot of things that Democrats, and I'm talking about leadership now, I'm talking about our Democratic leaders, have not wanted to do for fear of upsetting their major patrons and donors. Well, those days have to be over. If they're not over, I'm gonna tell you something. We are either gonna have a third party that will do that, or we are going to have more Donald Trumps as far as the eye can see, and we're gonna lose our democracy. Can I, That's I, really the choice. Can, can I jump in on that, John? And, Please. And I, I, I agree with Bob, but I, I, I'd like to, um, offer uh, a, a bit of a challenge to all of us because I, I think no single party or elected official is going to be capable of getting us out of this jam. Um, I think the depth of cross-partisan support for major change is very real. As Bob mentioned, those many people in so-called red states who would have chosen either Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump I was saying I came here by way of Cody, Wyoming. Wyoming voted 68% for Donald Trump. They are many of those people working very hard with us at American Promise uh, to win a constitutional amendment to reverse the Citizens United case. And I think we have to accept that all of us have a huge task to do because you have to fight whatever your partisan perspective for those policies we must win while at the same time figuring out how am I going to work with people who oppose those policies to save the country by fixing the rules of the system so it isn't rigged. And I offer some hope. I think we will see the fragmentation of the parties. We will see the threats or the actuality of people leaving the parties and starting new ones. That we have seen before. In all those periods that Bob mentioned about 
when we've gotten out of this, we've seen common things, real disruption. Uh, we've seen um, constitutional amendments. They come in waves. Uh, we got out of the hole in the Gilded Age four constitutional amendments between 1910 and 1920. The 1960s, we forget, you know, the lifetime of many of us, we did four constitutional amendments between 1963 and 1971, and they're democracy amendments, ending the poll tax, getting 18, 19, and 20 year olds the vote, you know, getting DC representatives or uh, residents the vote. And then that helps drive a whole wave of reform, but they're never done by just one party. They're done by the American people kind of stepping up and saying, you know, this old way is not going to work. We've got to rebuild the promise of America that we're actually equal citizens, that everybody gets to participate. Uh, we, we can't get the policies that I think many of you want and that Bob talked about in an oligarchy. And what we have now is an oligarchy where the very few rich, powerful interests are controlling the system, and they're not going to give up those policies in, until we turn the, that vicious circle into the virtuous circle. And the way we do that is rewrite the basic rules with the 28th Amendment, where we're basically re reasserting we do have the right to have reasonable limits on money and politics. We do have the right to be represented on equal terms not have, and have people represented, not donors. And that will accelerate some really big changes as it did in all those other times when we were in the hole. As Winston Churchill didn't actually say, I found out after quoting him for many years, um, <laughs> Americans always do the right thing after exhausting the other possibilities. So. <laughs> Stephen and, uh, and, and Bob, I want you to weigh in on how much you think uh, a constitutional amendment that effectively repeals Citizens United, how much difference would that make? Oh, I, th I think it would make a tremendous difference. Uh, I think we're just starting to see the effect of Citizens United. I mean, the, the real impact of that has not hit us anywhere near closely. Corporations you know, the large corporations simply did not give in the last election. That, that may not hold for a long time. I mean, they could, and if they decided to start giving, which it, it, it would change politics immensely in this country. So I, I think we're, we're just looking at the start of it. I, I want to sound a cautionary note here. I would like the Citizens United repealed or reversed obviously, but let's not pretend that before Citizens United, we had a political system that was responsive to average people. We had, before Citizens United, we had unbelievable amounts of money in politics. In fact, two very reputable professors did a study of how much influence average people, average people had on Congress between 1982 and 1996, and they found that the average American had zero influence on Congress. Now, I want to just say something that may not be comfortable, but I'm going to say it anyway, because you're all my neighbors and friends, or you will be until I say it. <laughs> it is very easy to blame the Supreme Court. It's very easy to blame Donald Trump. It's very easy to blame Trump voters. It's very easy to blame them for what's going on. But California has the greatest degree of inequality of any state. In Los Angeles, we've got 13,500 children who are living on the street. In San Francisco, we have basically rich people and homeless people and almost no middle class left. Housing is impossible to afford. Our children will not be able to live here. And what exactly are we doing about it? What are we doing about this? It is our responsibility. You know, uh, in California, I love living in California. I would not live in any other place. I've been here for 12 years, and I've been happier than I've ever been. But I'll tell you something. We are all in our own bubbles, and we all talk to each other, and we express how awful Donald Trump is and how terrible everything else is. But 
when it comes to actually us, we taking action, political action, mobilizing ourselves for what has to be done, we've got to do more. We've just got to do more. Can I, can I speak, respond to that? Um, we, we do have to do more, but I want to be, I want to be clear. When I'm talking about an amendment, I'm not talking about an amendment that takes us to 2009 before the Citizens United decision. Um, and what this constitutional amendment would do is fundamentally change uh, how we are operating our political system and how it has operated for the last 40 years. Um, my book describes how we got here, and it, the Citizens United decision was the end game, not the beginning. This started in 1976 with the Buckley decision that overturned the Watergate, post-Watergate reforms, and first decided that money is like free speech. That, that, that and followed about three years later when the Supreme Court decided a case called um, Bilotti versus First National Bank of Boston, uh, where the corporation said, we have the right to spend money in elections to, to, to determine the outcome of ballot initiatives. Well, you know what that ballot initiative was about? It was about whether Massachusetts would have a progressive income tax or not. There's probably nothing more effective at dealing with political and, and economic inequality, with economic inequality than how we decide to tax uh, incomes in this country. That Supreme Court uh, decision reversed the Massachusetts Supreme Court, which had decided there's nothing wrong with keeping corporate money out of citizen ballot initiatives. They're not citizens. The Supreme Court reversed that in a five to four decision. Today, 30 plus years later, we do not have a progressive income tax in Massachusetts. Bank Boston, Gillette, Digital Corporation did what they, the Supreme Court gave them a right to do and they spent money in that ballot initiative to defeat it. Uh, so we're still trying to push forward a fight that we started 40 years ago. The reason it is so hard is because the rules of the road are in the Constitution. And until we have rules of the road in the Constitution that say we, the people, have a right to decide citizen referendum and to elect politicians who represent people, not money, we won't be able to make the fundamental changes no matter how hard we try. And I agree with all those changes. I agree we must do something. And so this is not about just overturning Citizens United. This is, that's, no, no, that's like saying we're gonna overturn Minor versus Happersat. You know what Minor versus Happersat was? It was the Supreme Court decision that said women don't have a right to vote. Nobody says overturn Minor versus Happersat. They say equal right to vote. So we want an equal right to be represented in our political system. And I guarantee you, when Americans are represented, we won't choose the kind of outcomes we're getting now in an effective political process. We'll have much better outcomes. So it's not the cure-all, and there's no way we can do it or the resulting reforms without a lot of people stepping up and working really, really hard. But it's not about like blaming the court or blaming Trump. It's about fundamentally saying we, got, we went wrong those past 40 years and nobody's gonna save us but us. So we gotta do that hard work of getting two thirds of Congress and then 38 states to ratify this amendment. And the beauty of it is we're well on our way. Huge support, red, blue, and whatever other color independents have support well over 80%. So we can do this, but I do want to be clear, it's not easy and it's not about fixing something and saying that 2009 was just perfect. It's about changing the fundamental DNA that has been damaged by the Supreme Court decisions, which give us doctrines of inequality, political inequality, and corruption as the way we're supposed to be. And we're not supposed to be that way, so we got to change that. Now, I know Bob Reich doesn't want us to blame Donald Trump for everything, <laughs> but <laughs> the, uh, the latest, uh, the, the tax bill, or the, what we in California call these so-called tax cuts, is really going to amplify uh, a lot of this in income inequality. I want to get your take on it, Stephen Clifford, because it's something you've really focused well, in your well, book on CEO pay. Okay. Uh, yes, it was interesting, because in my book on CEO pay, I said that we should have an excise tax on excess CEO pay. In the job, uh, in the Tax Cut and Job Acts bill, the Republicans, without a Democratic vote, did slap an excise tax on CEO pay, an excise tax of 21% on all CEO pay above a million dollars 
at nonprofits. <laughs> I, I am not making this up. I am not making this up. Uh, <laughs> uh, and actually, I'm working with a, a, some other groups to try and get Democrats to propose extending that uh, excise tax to for-profits, where people are making $120 million a year, and they're worried that somebody at a university got paid a million five, apparently. Uh, CEO pay, it turn, you know, it's, it's a small issue. I'm not talking about anything as large and as consequential as the 28th Amendment, or as, as Bob's book has a series of, of issues, which could be transformational. But this, this is a low-hanging fruit. If you can't do anything about this, which nobody other than 500 CEOs favors, uh, you know, forget, about, forget about larger ones. This, this issue, the way CEOs are paid causes a lot of economic harm in this country. Uh, I'll, let me just give you one example of the economic harm that it causes in this country. Uh, CEOs are paid every year on results that happen by the end of that year. So that they, they are forced by the nature of their pay to take a very, very short-term view. Now, 85% of their compensation is in one form of equity or another, stock options, restricted stock, etc. The average CEO, average Fortune 500 CEO, spends 4.7 years in that job. So he'll be leaving soon. He'll be cashing out very soon. Also, uh, today, keeping a high stock price is often a bonus metric. Part of your bonus is you get part of your bonus for keeping the stock price very high. Well, so you've got a huge incentive to get that stock price up if you're a CEO today. Now, there are two ways to do this. One way is the very, very hard work of actually producing better products and have, well, you know, having better customer service and more efficient production. That's a lot of hard work. There's a very easy way to do it, and that's to buy back your own stock. Uh, this is the way we, America has chosen. In the last uh, 12 years, uh, S&P 500, 500 companies have spent five trillion dollars buying back their own stock. This is five trillion that could have been invested in new technology, product development, workforce training, whole new industries like the Chinese are doing. Uh, instead, they spent it to cut to buy back their own stock, thus getting huge bonuses uh, and even huger bonuses when they cashed in. At the same time, they cut R&D by 50%. This, this is all happening simply because of the way they're paid. And uh, it, it, it is also, let, let me take one more uh, about the, we've talked about how the bottom 90% has suffered, actually the bottom, and, and the 1%, the especially the one-tenth of the 1% has gotten all the money. Since 1980, 40% of the economic gains have gone to the one-tenth of the 1%, a very, very small number of people. Now, they're not basketball players. They're not movie stars. 70% of the 0.1% are business executives, and those are business executives whose pay is highly influenced by what CEOs make. So we're not talking about, oh, 500 guys are, made, are paid $30 million a year, big deal, what does it matter? We're talking about a huge shift of income to business executives in the 0.1% that used to go to the 90% and the 99%. So it sounds like a small issue, and it is a small issue compared to what these other people are talking about, but it's probably the one that is most quickly achievable. Bob Rice, you've written a lot about how uh, uh, you know, your, your criticism of the tax bill, maybe you can expand a bit on how you think it contributes to this vicious cycle that you mentioned. I'm old enough to remember the Eisenhower administration. Anybody else? <laughs> well, Dwight Eisenhower, as you remember, in the 1950s was a Republican. He was President of the United States. He was a former general. Under the Eisenhower administration, the top marginal tax rate was 91%. <laughs> now, 
nobody would have accused Dwight Eisenhower of being a socialist. <laughs> Maybe Joe McCarthy <laughs> thought about it. <laughs> now, even if you got rid of and considered all of the tax credits and tax deductions, the top marginal tax rate was still way over 50%. How do you explain what has happened since? Well, one explanation, and a big explanation, has to do with money in politics. The more money in politics coming from the top, obviously, the first thing they're going to do is reduce their taxes. But I want to suggest to you that there's also something else. And that is that in the first decades after the Second World War, there was an appreciation that we Americans were all in the same boat together and we were interdependent in the sense that we had gone through a war, we'd gone through a Great Depression, we knew what social solidarity meant and we knew why we depended on each other. We knew why CEO pay should not be larger, the ratio of CEO pay to ordinary, the worker pay shouldn't be more than 20 to one. It would have been unseemly in our society. I came out to Berkeley for the first time as a graduate student in 1968, and you know how much I spent on tuition and fees per semester? Zero? <laughs> No, it was about $28, <laughs> as I recall. Well, now, why was that? Well, partly because higher education was not nearly as expensive, but also because the people of California taxed themselves to pay for our schools and our universities and our freeways. And California was number one, number one in the country in terms of public investment. And Californians understood we were all in it together. Well, we can get back there again, but some of it requires that we <clears throat> renew our commitment to our democracy and to our fellow citizens, that we change the definition of patriotism from this shallow notion that patriotism is about saluting the flag and standing for the national anthem and securing our borders, when actual patriotism is about sacrificing for the good of all. Patriotism is about the common good. Jeff Clement, I wanted a chance for you to weigh in on uh, the effect of money on the, on the tax bill, corporate political donations. Have you had a chance to take a look at that? Oh, yeah, I think, that, I mean, there's no question, and it's certainly not the first time we have seen massive tax cuts for the wealthy and corporations uh, that are not what most people would think was the number one thing the country ought to be doing. And remember, this is, a, this is uh, the majority in, in, in who controls the, the Congress at the moment has been talking for 30 years about fiscal responsibility, budget, budget, balanced budgets, and we are seriously heading towards a very, very dangerous level of national debt, and uh, it's something that this majority used to talk about, and so there's really a, a difficult way to, uh, I mean, it's hard to look at this situation and assess that the reasons for doing it are other than political influence could by very uh, uh, influential uh, donors and, uh, and you know I, I, my book came out before this particular tax bill but you can look at it it's a recurring theme and one thing I, I, I spend a little bit of, a, of time on is the the so-called hedge fund loophole where <laughs> hedge fund people who run hedge funds uh, get compensated based on a percentage of the assets and a percentage of the earnings and there may well be good reasons to have uh, a different capital gains tax than an income tax. That's an arguable policy question about whether you want to encourage more risk taking by having lower tax rates for capital gains. But there is no policy reason for advocating that hedge fund compensation, which is virtually guaranteed and they're paying themselves and it's hundreds of millions of dollars frequently, sometimes over a billion dollars, 
is uh, that you need some lower tax rate in order to encourage that kind of compensation. And yet, George Bush called to get rid of this loophole. Obama called to get rid of this loophole. It's the annual ritual is about as frequent as the Easter egg roll on the White House lawn. They all say, this is really stupid. Why are we doing this? And yet, the hedge fund industry and the donors mobilize, and we have an insensible policy that makes no sense, that costs the country a, a, a um, huge amount of, of money, and that you and we are all paying for, <coughs> so that people who are literally making a billion dollars in compensation pay far less than a teacher or a nurse on, who, on their income. So. They're, they're, uh, yes, donors and corporate interests drive tax policy like they drive everything else, and we all pay a price for it. Uh, Je Jeff, I, I think you just don't recognize the magic of trickle-down. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I, I mean... Uh, <laughs> the magic yeah, eludes me. <laughs> the, and, and, uh, and, uh, you know, in 1589, uh, Henry of Navarre, Henry of the Fourth, was the first bourbon crowned and initiated a trickle-down policy. Uh, which might have worked had it lasted longer because they had a revolution 200 years later in 1789, and it, it didn't have time to work. But, but <laughs> if we give trickle down enough time, I, I think we'll... You know, it's interesting. Uh, the Trump and the Republicans do believe that the poor need less money in order to have the proper incentives and the rich need more money in terms of having the proper incentives. Uh, and trickle-down is a good example of, of a public policy that has been tried over and over again. It's one of the few economic policies that has been unfortunate enough to have been tried in practice and shown to be a complete hoax, and yet it does not die. And as to corporations being people, I will believe that corporations are people when Texas executes a corporation. <laughs> well, you, you, know, you know, Bob, uh, your line about thinking less money for the poor um, actually incentivizes them, you know, drew some laughter, but just this past week, Ben Carson has been talking about tripling the rate of, uh, of housing rents on the lowest income Americans with the idea that somehow that would incentivize them to break away from public assistance. I mean, crazy. Stephen Clifford, I want to follow up. I'm sure I'm not the only one here who was, who was not aware of the, uh, the tax on excessive nonprofit <laughs> executive compensation. It, it got no, uh, it didn't get much publicity. And, and before I run back to the Chronicle office to write an editorial about that, <laughs> uh, in, in your book, you, you actually come out with a proposal of, that would it, that would put a lux what you call luxury tax, luxury kind tax. of similar to Major League Baseball. Good enough on, for our national pastime. On executive compensation over $6 million a year for for-profit corporations. You being too easy on them? Uh, it was at the time the lowest number I thought that I could possibly get by with, but now that the Republicans have put it in a million, I'll bow to their genius. <laughs> you know, I, 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 you may, your proposal makes me think of, in 1992, Bill Clinton, <clears throat> running for president, proposed that any executive pay over a million dollars not be deductible from corporate income for tax purposes. And I thought it was a pretty good idea. And then Bill Clinton asked the Secretary of the Treasury, who was then Lloyd Benson, and the head of the National Economic Council, who was then Bob Rubin, and me, to come up with a very specific rule that the Treasury Department <coughs> would impose in the Internal Revenue Code to implement this good idea. And I remember that meeting very, very distinctly. I don't know that any of, well, I'm at liberty to talk about it. If you keep it in this tent. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it on the front page tomorrow, Bob. <laughs> uh, Lloyd Benson uh, is no longer with us, so I don't want to be certainly uh, critical of someone who can't defend himself. Bob Rubin is still around. Uh, but they both said, I said, uh, I said well, well, the proposal is any executive pay over a million dollars should not be deductible from corporate income taxes. That's pretty straightforward. And they said, no, 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 because uh, 
Well, if it ought to, executive pay ought to be linked to performance. Performance. If it's linked to performance, then any executive pay over a million dollars would be sh completely fine. But we need to link it to performance. That's the condition. So as long as it's linked to corporate performance, then it can be deductible over a million dollars. And I said, no. And they said, yes. And the vote was two to one. <laughs> and the proposal went to Bill Clinton, and the rest is history. But here's the interesting thing. Performance meant stock options. <clears throat> and so from that time forward, a huge percentage of executive pay Absolutely. has been in the form of shares of stock. And not only is it in the form of shares of stock, but you, know, wonder, you wonder why companies are buying back so much of their stock and why, why they're using all of their extra benefits and extra earnings from the corporate tax cut of December to buy back their shares of stock instead of investing and giving their workers raises as we were told they were going to do. Well, they're buying back their shares of stock because that's the easiest short-term way of increasing share prices so that the executives can cash in their stock options. This is not complicated. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me make a couple, a couple of additions to that. First, uh, when an executive cashes in his stock options for a huge gain, it is not counted as compensation according to the uh, accounting profession. So I get uh, a million, I get, last year, we have executives cashing in for $100 million gains on stock options. It was not reported as compensation. It was just uh, something the tooth fairy left under his pillow. Um, second, performance. Uh, it, this has been studied time and time again. Uh, American pay for CEOs and company performance by its long-term stock appreciation are either uncorrelated or negatively correlated. Companies haven't figured out how to, how to properly measure performance or reward CEOs. And in fact, there's a whole lot of, of research that shows that for anything other than rep repetitive or odious tasks, uh, financial incentives, large financial incentives impair performance because they focus you only on what that incentive of getting that incentive. So if it's making earnings per share go up 10%, that's, and you can make $20 million for doing that, that's all you're going to think about. You're not going to think about innovations and personnel and workforce training or any of that. And so there's this huge body of evidence that this doesn't work. And you have these boards who are supposedly sophisticated business people who talk about how everything is quantified and analyzed and rigorously weighed. And then when it comes to paying their CEO, it's voodoo. And they say, that's just fine. It's amazing. I want to throw out the, uh, the impact. I mean, obviously, you know, we're here in Berkeley. The folks here get it. You know, we're certainly getting a lot of applause lines, but this is, these, issues are not resonating so much in, in red states. Bob, I want to start with you because you're certainly a, also a student uh, and observer of the media. Uh, obviously, a lot of people are getting their news from sources that validate their preconceptions. I mean, how do we break through, how do, how do these issues break through to people who are in their own bubbles or their own uh, walls, if you will, and are not, not hearing these kinds of arguments? Uh, I wish I had an easy answer. I don't. Uh, I remember before Fox News, there was politics, and there was right-wing politics and very vicious right-wing politics. I don't think Roger Ailes is the only contributor. But I think Fox News has created an alternative universe. And I urge you at some peril to your own psyche to watch some Fox News. <laughs> and I say that, and I urge that only because it's important you know the parallel universe that a lot of Americans are living in. 
And I want to go back to my request to so many of you who have friends and relatives in red states. It's important that we reach out, and it's important that we really talk. I tell my students here at Cal that the best way of learning is to talk to people who disagree with you because that will sharpen your own understanding of why you believe what you believe and it will also help them question their assumptions. And we are not doing that anymore in this country. Uh, I find that maybe over the long term one of the greatest dangers and threats to our democracy. Yeah. So, Go ahead, Jeff. John, it's a, it's a great question and one that we actually created American Promise to wrestle with because the thing about a constitutional amendment, any constitutional amendment, including the one I'm talking about, is there's no way to do it without figuring out the answer to that question because you have to basically have a super majority of Americans willing to act on that. Uh, we need two-thirds of Congress. We need ratification in three-quarters of the states. So we started American Promise in January 2016. We've gone from zero to 250,000 people in every single state, all 50 states. As I said, I came from Wyoming. And what we learned is we, uh, we support, inspire, support, empower local associations. We don't do it in Washington. We try to empower people where they live and support their work. And we found it, people are responding very strongly, whether it's a red state, blue state, you name it. Um, they want to get this done, and they're, and they're willing to come out and work together. And the thing is, it actually generates local media. So I think local matters a lot, and local media matter a lot. Um, Wyoming, I swear, they, our folks from what they call Wyoming Promise are in some Wyoming media probably every two weeks or so. <laughs> and the, and it's, um, we saw it in St. Louis, where the St. Louis Dispatch covered it, the St. Louis Public Radio, albeit an NPR <laughs> affiliate. But any part of the country, people are forming these local American Promise Associations, acting together, realizing they got to figure out how to get out of their bubbles, work together to get this done. And, and I think that you will find is not only effective ways of advancing what we need to do in this country, but actually personally rewarding too. We find that people discover uh, things about their neighbors uh, that they really end up appreciating to their surprise sometimes. And so uh, we're going to keep doing it. We think it's very effective. And I'll tell you, we um, let me just give you um, quickly nine communities in Wisconsin three weeks ago on the Tuesday election they had in Wisconsin, voted on in a local ballot initiatives on whether to support this 28th Amendment. 800 communities have done that so far. What happened in Wisconsin three weeks ago, we have seen almost every time, the average vote yes was 81%. The most conservative county in Wisconsin, I'm told, St. Croix County, had it on their ballot, 77% yes. Paul Ryan's hometown, the House Speaker's hometown, Janesville, Wisconsin, 84% yes for this amendment. So this is something we can do together, and the country will be better off, and we'll be all better off. You know, it, Great. it's interesting, uh, Jeff, if you'd let me. Uh, when I uh, go into red states, and I try to do it a lot, uh, I am surprised at the extent to which when I call for getting big money out of politics, it's an applause line. Yeah. I mean, people really want big money out of politics. They are appalled by crony capitalism. Uh, there's a fellow named David Bratt, a congressman from the 7th District of Virginia. Anybody know him? Mm -hmm. uh, he was the one who actually got rid of Eric Cantor. Uh, years ago. But anyway, uh, this fellow is a Republican. He's not only a conservative Republican, but the Conservative Digest has named him as the most conservative member of Congress. Now, I went to visit him uh, because I thought, well, what's there to lose? <laughs> and we had a discussion about three hours, and the most interesting part of the discussion was he was absolutely committed to ending crony capitalism getting rid of corporate welfare, getting big money out of politics, and 
All of that part of the discussion, the rest of the discussion, we disagreed on everything, but the, that part of the discussion, he sounded like Bernie Sanders. It could have come out of Bernie Sanders' mouth. And I thought, well, there is really hope here on this particular set of issues. We're going to go to uh, audience questions, so I'll hold off giving you the toll-free number for Chronicle subscriptions. <laughs> yes. uh, Gary, if you raise your hand, Gary will be working the mic, and it's your turn. Thank you very much for this session. It's been wonderful. I just wanted to ask you, those periods where you said America managed to turn things around between 1910 and 20, and then in the 60s, was being at war a factor? And would that worry you about turning things around now? Actually, the, the first period, the progressive era, starting in 1901 when Teddy Roosevelt accidentally became president, uh, when McKinley was shot, uh, that was not a war. Uh, that was, the Gilded Age was in full bloom. Uh, we had not yet gone into World War I, that was, 20, that was 1916. Uh, no, that was a period of peace, but it was a period in which inequality had reached extraordinary proportions, similar to what it is today, actually a little worse than it is today. Corruption had got to the point where the lackeys of the robber barons, the wealthy heads of industry, actually put sacks of money down on the desks of pliant legislators, openly. Uh, and there was a great deal of unsafe foods and unsafe working conditions. Uh, the public rose up, and the muckrakers, we call them investigative journalists today, but they, we called them muckrakers then. Uh, they, along with Teddy Roosevelt, along with the public, and it was the, uh, it was the working class, it was the middle class, they demanded change, and we got change. Uh, the 60s, many of you and I remember, yes, the Vietnam War was very important, but the civil rights movement came before the Vietnam War. And that movement, the civil rights movement, was, it seems to me, one of the most galvanizing, creative, and important periods of time in America, dealing with the issues of equal political rights and equal, eventually, Martin Luther King turned to, and the movement turned toward equal opportunity and equal economic positions and opportunities. And that, again, that was killed by the Vietnam War in a way. So war is not necessary to these <clears throat> social movements. In fact, war is anathema to these social movements. The progressive era of the first decade of the 20th century ended with World War I. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, Professor Reich, about halfway through the program, you ran down a list of uh, uh, issues, including government guaranteed jobs, medical care for all, others that I think just about everyone in the bubble here would be inclined to agree with. Um, uh, before we started at lunch, I read today's mailing from the DCC and Tom Perez, of course seeking a large amount of money, and running down a, a, a list of platform items which were old, familiar, positive, but nothing new kinds of things. My question is, how in the world do we bring the DCC on a united basis around to some of these critical issues? Well, the Bay Area has a huge advantage with the DCCC and also the Senate Campaign Committee. You know what that is? Money. <laughs> they all come out to the Bay Area for money. We are the biggest, geographically, the biggest contributor to the Democratic Party. Well, not all of us, obviously, but a lot of people here and a lot of people who we know, and I think it's very important that the Bay Area stand up to the Democratic Party and say, we are not going to continue to fund you unless you come up with the kind of reforms and ideas and bold actions that are gonna turn this around. Hi, Dr. Reich. Uh, years ago, you were a hero of mine when uh, you did a special with Dr. Deming, and uh, 
Today, I, I disagree with you. I, I think you're misleading the, com the country with half facts. And I don't know where you are. I'm right here. <laughs> and and I would he? really like to uh, oh. have that substantive conversation with you in public or debate, whatever you want to call it, because we're getting a complete misinformation campaign. The middle class didn't shrink because more Americans became poor. It beca it's because the middle class became rich. The rate of poverty hasn't increased. The rate of poverty has been dead flat for 50 years. So we're, we're misleading people. None of you talked about K-12 education as a real root cause to Americans' income inequalities and lack of progress. Our K-12 schools, we've got kids in neighborhoods like here where 4% of black 12th graders are proficient in math. Just if I if, can interrupt, if, if we, this could lead to a question, yeah. please. Are you willing to debate me? <laughs> well, let's debate right now. Do you believe, and according to the data coming out of the Bureau of Commerce, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the research of Emmanuel Says here at Cal, do you believe that the median wage of American workers has barely increased in the last 35 years? even though the American economy has grown 80%. Hello, you who asked my question, and you said I'm misleading people. Do you think that that's correct, or do you think that's incorrect? Okay, let's go to another question, because I think uh, Bob was asking it rhetorically. I moved we'll save I, the I debate on, for another sorry. program. I would love to okay. debate you anytime, any place. Anywhere. All right. Um, timing's pretty good. I am a middle school teacher uh, in Oakland. And 8% um, of our students are fully proficient in math. So not quite the five, but not great. And you're welcome to come and speak to my history class anytime you like. But um, I want to ask, uh, there does seem to be a right-wing war on education, especially in the red states. Uh, it's led to some wildcat strikes and whatnot in places like West Virginia, now spraying to Arizona. I wanted to ask you if you think it's deliberate, if there is a deliberate dumbing down of America so that they can be more easily sold you know, these platitudes that keep, you know, people supporting a system that essentially hurts 99% of Americans. Uh, I, I, I will say that I, I don't think they're that competent. Uh, <clears throat> uh, seriously, I think what you have is these states that for years and years and years have said, cut taxes, cut taxes, cut taxes. Well, Eventually, you, you cut services, and that's what they've done with education, which is one of the biggest uh, services their tax base gives. I don't think it was a deliberate assault on, on education. I think they would assault, they've assaulted all sorts of other agencies, health care and, and whatnot. If you're not willing to pay taxes, you're not going to have any government services. That's what they're finding out now. We're all the way in the back here. Hi, thank you all for this wonderful <coughs> panel. We've really enjoyed it. Um, my question is about what we in the Bay Area and in California can do. We are, um, I work for a nonprofit, <coughs> one of those nonprofits that's never gonna have a CEO hitting the um, tax cutoff. Um, we organize in low-income communities of color in California's urban centers, so we're seeing the displacement, we're seeing the failure of the education system, and our members are self-empowering in some pretty noticeable ways. We have a progressive majority in the city of Richmond where we organize. And my question is, are there specific measures that any of the three of you are looking at on the sort of municipal or regional level or statewide as opposed to having a federal focus? Can I? 
I'll jump in on that first quickly. Um, yes, uh, we, so I mentioned 800 cities and towns have done those resolutions. We're actually organizing locally, organizing statewide, networking <laughs> that up for the national impact. Now, the thing about a constitutional amendment um, fitting with the, the various issues you mentioned. I think obviously people need to fight for what is most pertinent, where they live, on the ground, their issues, and sometimes constitutional amendment seems like that's wonkery or not really. And I think what I'd encourage is to think of it as, you know, our right. It's not a campaign finance policy question. It's not a constitutional, you know, complicated question of the First Amendment, it's fundamentally, do you or do you not have an equal right to be represented in the political system? So I think we have to fight for the policies that will help those situations, but we also have to, I, I would urge us to in, encourage all of the groups we work with to at the same time refuse to accept what is in effect second class citizenship. Like donors get immediate representation, donors get their calls returned immediately, that the court says we're not allowed to have any limits on money. Well, that's essentially saying we have an oligarchy where wealthy people get better treatment and we just have to work within that system and try to get a little bit better outcomes. I think all of us, whether it's environment, healthcare, jobs, you know, whatever the issue is, we can also be saying, and look, we insist that we're equal citizens. We must have a fix to this and a constitutional amendment to fix this so we can be represented <coughs> on equal terms. And then it's about empowering and fighting for your own rights, not a complicated or, you know, far away question of campaign finance law. It's really that fundamental American question that all of the positive social movements have been is that, look, no matter who you are, you count. You're an equal citizen in this country, and we're going to have to fight for it again. And so uh, we organize locally. We look for local wins around resolutions. Um, and then we partner, including in, in, in Richmond, where Chevron spent $3 million on a city council race uh, after the refinery blew up. So these are often very local <laughs> issues about imbalances in political power where money is being used to silence and disempower people. And we have to fight that at the same time. And we at American Promise are eager to learn from folks like your group on the ground and help you as well. So uh, let, me, let me just uh, answer that, or at least offer some suggestions. Because it's very, very difficult at the local level to have a huge impact because today, what is local? I mean, the boundaries of a city are almost arbitrary because every city in most urban areas, like the Bay Area, moves up against every other city. The good news is that California is, at least putatively, a democratic state with a democratic governor, democratic legislature, and California is big. We have one out of eight Americans living in California. One sixth of, in fact, if, if California were a, a nation, we would be the sixth largest national economy. So what we do here in California has a huge impact. We can see on the environment, California has led the country, led the world in many respects on the environment, so much so that the Trump administration is almost waging war on California. That is a badge of honor. <laughs> but, what, but California can do much more on health care and on schooling and on other issues, housing. Uh, we could, and we almost did, get a variation on Medicare for all or single payer. We should keep on fighting for that. Stephen uh, Clifford, I know you want to get in the last word. Uh, after the last presidential election, I concluded that straight white males should not be allowed to vote. And th that's something you can start on at the local level. <coughs> please, please join me in thanking our terrific panelists today. Stephen Clifford, Robert Rice, Jeff Clements.